coming up this evening, live from New York City. The White House says no final decision yet on student loan cancellation, after a news report said the administration is looking to cancel $10,000 of debt per student. The Biden administration could be restarting idle oil refineries. Could we soon be paying less at the pump? Could China's digital currency allow the Chinese Communist Party to spy on you? A group of lawmakers wants to make sure that doesn't happen. That and much more coming up on NTD Business. Great to have you with us. Chenny Wu here for NTD Business. The Biden administration said today it hasn't decided on student loan cancellation yet. Earlier today, the Washington Post reported Biden was planning to cancel $10,000 in student debt per borrower, citing insider sources. But one White House spokesperson said no decisions have been made when he was asked about the report. He did add that student loan payments have been paused since the pandemic. But that pause will expire after August. According to the New York Fed, canceling $10,000 per student would cost the federal government about $320 billion. That would wipe out debts for nearly one-third of student loan borrowers. Biden promised some form of student loan cancellation when he was running for president. But the people opposing the idea say it's unfair to those who already paid off their loans. And it shifts the burden to taxpayers. Meanwhile, some Democrats are saying $10,000 is not enough. They want Biden to cancel at least $50,000 per student. Wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have student loans? Well, New York State tried that out not long ago, allowing some students a free ride to college. But not based on grades. It was only based on income. NTD's Phil Zhou has that story. Free college is not a new concept, but usually to score a free ride, you'll need good grades. In 2017, New York State offers some students free tuition, even if they have bad grades. To completely uh, eradicate or mitigate the expense of college and university for students is unrealistic. Clemon Moore Jr. knows a few things about scholarships. He's awarded over $100,000 to students through his writing contest on his website, From Failure to Promise. So without that financial requirement, students may be less incentivized to be dedicated and committed to going the extra mile uh, to, to succeed uh, in college coursework. But the program in New York, which was based on income and not grades, didn't do so well. Nearly one million students and their families qualify for the free tuition. But by the end of this academic year, only around 70,000 students actually received the scholarship. A lot of programs have a fairly high dropout rate, a uh, rate of people who fail to complete the program and so on. Richard Vetter is a distinguished professor of economics at Ohio University. I question the propriety and the appropriateness of giving uh, people money uh, without expecting anything in return, without having a merit-based uh, aspect to it. Many students who do qualify don't end up attending college. The student body for undergraduates shrunk by over one million students, or a 10 percent drop since 2020. To see that kind of money left on the table and kids not taking advantage of getting a college education, which is needed for almost three quarters of the jobs in this country. Uh, is uh, quite disappointing. Stuart Siegel is a financial aid guru with over 25 years of experience. Well, if it's free, you know, will the students take advantage of it and actually go to class and earn that degree? Is that money, you know, going to be well spent? Where are they going to come up with the room and board and the books and the personal expenses? Some believe that keeping the standards high will help the students prepare better for life. Once a student graduates and they're working adult and they have the responsibilities and the pressures that come with being an adult and working in a workplace, there's going to be deadlines. There's going to be financial requirements as well as performance expectations and requirements. Phil Zhou, NTD News, New York. California's energy prices, already high, are likely to get higher. The long drought they're facing could lower their hydropower by almost a half. That's according to the Energy Information Administration. 
It says hydropower may be producing 8% of California's electricity, as opposed to 15%. This may also lead to a 6% increase in carbon dioxide emissions and a 5% increase in electricity prices. Government data show that California has the second highest residential electricity prices in the country, behind Hawaii. Officials say the state may lose power this summer during heat waves and wildfires because the grid lacks capacity. To travel or not to travel? That is the question many Americans face this Memorial Day weekend. Surging gas prices are one of the main reasons people are staying home. Here's more. According to AAA figures, the average gas price in the U.S. on Thursday hit $4.60 per gallon. And in California, which is home to the nation's highest gas prices, it topped $6 per gallon. But despite the high gas prices, millions of Americans are still planning to travel 50 miles or more away from home this Memorial Day weekend. We are forecasting about 39.2 million people are going to be traveling for this Memorial Day holiday period, which is about five days. And about 88% of those folks are going to be going by car. The number of estimated travelers is up 8.3% from 2021 and would be close to 2017 levels, but it would still be below pre-pandemic 2019 levels, which was a peak year for travel. AAA says they've never had a Memorial Day travel period where so many people are traveling by car while gas prices are so high. Despite these record high gasoline prices, we are expecting, based on what we're seeing for Memorial Day, that it's going to be a very robust travel period for summer. People just want to get out and go. Dan Johnson and his family are among those choosing to travel despite the high gas prices. They're going from Paoli, Pennsylvania to Boston. My wife's family's, uh, her sister's graduating from Tufts University in Boston, so we really didn't have a choice and we just toughed it up and, you know, whatever the gas price is, we have to, unfortunately, we have to pay for it. But, you know, we want to go visit our family, so this is the cost that's involved. But not everyone is willing to pay the price. For some people, the gas prices are exactly what's caused them to rethink their holiday plans. So as far as road trips, M Memorial Day is coming up and I am totally against it because, you know, you're going to spend more money getting there paying for gas than you actually are, you know, to enjoy your visit. Jim Burkhardt, head of oil market research at S&P Global, says he wouldn't expect much relief this summer at the pump and that this is especially true if Americans drive in great numbers, which is expected to happen. The Biden administration is reportedly reaching out to the oil industry to talk about restarting closed refineries, an attempt by the White House to tackle high gas prices. Will turning refineries back on help with how much you pay at the pump? And today's Don Ma speaks with Jason Isaac, energy expert and director of think tank Life Powered. Jason, thanks for joining us today. So the Biden administration is apparently looking at possibly restarting closed refineries to tackle gas prices. I want to get your reaction. Are you uh, feeling optimistic? What are you feel feeling hearing this? No, this isn't optimistic. It's a, a last ditch effort and continues the streak of the Biden administration reaching out and begging Venezuela, begging Iran, uh, Iran for oil. Uh, when we have those natural resources right here in North America, uh, it's gonna take a year, maybe 18 months to get reshuttered or, or shuttered refineries back open. Would you just briefly explain what the roles of refineries are? So the refinery is referred to as really the downstream where you take oil and gas that has been piped uh, to these refineries. This is what the Keystone Pipeline was going to do. It was going to bring heavy crude uh, from North America, from Canada, down into the United States, into the Gulf of Mexico, where that would then be refined into products such as diesel, gasoline, plastics. Uh, th those refineries is where we get the goods that really are powering our nation. So Jason, high gas prices, are we not producing enough or are we not refining enough? No, our re refining capacity, I believe, in the last 10 years has decreased significantly. I think it's about 50 percent. Uh, so you can't get the assets that you need, the capital that you need to build a new refinery. And if you could, you likely can't get it approved from the federal government because the regulations and the permitting process takes years. So do you think uh, restarting refineries will have an impact on gas prices at the pump? 
I think the best thing that the uh, government can do right now is to get out of the way. And that's going to send signals to the market that they'll actually be able to produce, pipe, and refine more oil and gas here in the United States, which just those signals alone will decrease the cost because uh, the markets will react in that fashion. Do you see any hope for gas prices coming down in anytime soon? Unfortunately, no, maybe not until after the November elections. Uh, we're we're going to see high demand uh, and continue to rise here in the summer. You're going to see higher electricity costs. Uh, those electricity costs, you need a lot of electricity to refine goods. Uh, and so with those costs increasing, you're going to continue to see the cost of producing, refining uh, the energy products that we use on a daily basis is going to continue to increase. Do you have any advice for uh, everyday Americans who uh, this is impacting? Absolutely. They need to contact their elected officials and tell them to embrace American energy and American energy independence. We should be building pipelines. We should be we should restart and build. But uh, the Department of Interior, the EPA, they are approving uh, windmills that produce electricity when the wind is blowing, uh, if it's not blowing too hard, but not not approving any new leases, not approving new pipelines or new refining capabilities. Uh, and that's incredibly detrimental. So we've got to get those agencies to listen to the elected officials. Jason Isaac, director of Light Power, thank you for coming on. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Wall Street closed much higher today. All three major indexes were positive for the week after several weeks of sell-off. The Dow gained 576 points, or one and eight tenths of a percent. The S&P added 100 points, or two and a half percent, and the Nasdaq rose 390 points, or three and three tenths of a percent. Inflation stayed historically hot, but ran a little cooler in April, according to the Commerce Department. Its PCE inflation measure is the Federal Reserve's favorite way to track prices. In the 12 months through April, overall prices were up 6.3 percent. It was 6.6 percent in March. Anxious shoppers can only hope the trend continues. Food prices continue to rise. They're up 10 percent since last year and accelerating. The Federal Reserve's target for core PCE is 2 percent, but this month's reading is 2.5 times higher than that. Many blame its decision to lower interest rates and facilitate massive money printing during the pandemic for the inflation we're seeing. The island nation of Sri Lanka is about to fire up its money printing presses again, despite facing devastating inflation. Here's its prime minister. Inflation can go well into the 40s. Remember, one is the price adjustments we are making. Secondly is the fact that we printed money. We have no rupee revenue. And now we have to uh, print another trillion rupees. So you just you can see how inflation is, uh, will have an impact here. Sri Lanka's currency has fallen 40% against the U.S. dollar over the past two months. That makes it extremely difficult to pay for critical imports like fuel using its own currency. It could use U.S. dollars instead, but it doesn't have any left. It's bankrupt. The prime minister says the country will ask the IMF for a loan soon. It's also hinted the Chinese Communist Party is ready to take advantage of Sri Lanka's predicament and offer it finance. We don't have details on that yet. And for some patients in Sri Lanka, a medicine shortage caused by the economic crisis could mean the difference between life and death. Some doctors say hospitals have to postpone life-saving procedures because they don't have the drugs needed. Rachel Graham reports. This cancer hospital on the outskirts of Colombo is on the front line of Sri Lanka's medicine shortage. And doctors say that the lack of necessary drugs could soon cause deaths as they are forced to postpone life-saving procedures. Sri Lanka imports more than 80% of its medical supplies. But with foreign currency reserves running out because of the country's economic crisis, essential medications are disappearing from shelves. At the 950-bed Apeksha Cancer Hospital, Dr. Roshan Amaratunga says major surgeries have been cancelled at short notice. Because as a government hospital, we depend on the government supplies. Even at the present, situation is endangering to their lives. So, I can't make it any more comments. It's a death penalty will be there. 
According to a government official procuring medical supplies, about 180 essential items are running out, with Sri Lanka's medical system close to collapse. Shortages include injections for dialysis patients, medicine for transplant patients and certain cancer drugs. India and Japan are helping to provide supplies, but it could take months for them to arrive. Binuli Bimsara's four-year-old child is receiving leukemia treatment at a Peshka hospital. Now we are really scared. Previously, we at least had some hope because we had the medication, but now we are living under tremendous fear. We are really helpless. Our future is really dark when we hear about a shortage of medicines. We don't have money to take our child abroad for treatment either. Sri Lanka is grappling with its most devastating economic crisis since independence in 1948. It's been caused by a combination of the impacts of COVID-19 on its tourism-reliant economy, rising oil prices, populist tax cuts and a ban on the import of chemical fertilisers, which has devastated the country's agricultural sector. A lot of the medicine consumed by Americans is produced in India. The country is the world's third largest medicine maker by volume, but it's heavily dependent on China for raw materials. NTD's Sean Marshall tells us how India is trying to fix this. A third of the medical pills consumed in the United States are made in India. India is the third largest drug manufacturer by volume. But India is very dependent on ingredients that come from China. One government report says India imports 68% of its active pharmaceutical ingredients from China because they're cheap. Another report puts it at 85%. Another report says drugs that use these Chinese ingredients include penicillin and azithromycin. To fix this, India launched the production-linked incentive scheme. This PLI scheme was aimed at incentivizing the industry in terms of increasing local production of such APIs or KSMs so that the dependence on China can reduce to some extent. Deepak Jatwani is an assistant vice president at credit ratings firm ICRA Limited, the Indian affiliate of Moody's. The firm does credit ratings for Indian pharmaceutical companies. Jatwani says the total investment is around 210 billion Indian rupees or around 2.7 billion US dollars. We expect that the overall import dependence, which is as high as 65-70% uh, at present, to go down by almost 25 to 30 percent over the next five to six years. And some of India's largest pharmaceutical companies are involved, including Sun Pharmaceutical Industries, Dr. Reddy's Laboratories, Lupin, and Aurobindo Pharma. Sean Marshall, NTD News. A U.S. bill would prohibit Google and Apple from hosting apps that accept China's digital yuan. This is amid fears that China's digital currency could allow Beijing to spy on Americans. The bill, unveiled Thursday, is sponsored by Senators Tom Cotton, Marco Rubio and Mike Braun. According to Cotton's office, the digital yuan could provide the Chinese government with real-time visibility into all transactions and would pose privacy concerns to Americans. If you have any children in school who did virtual learning during the pandemic, You'll want to hear this. There may have been more to that time online than just math lessons and science class. Millions of students were tracked by educational apps and websites without their consent. In many cases, that information was shared with third-party advertising companies like Google and Facebook. All this information came out this week in a report by Human Rights Watch. The group looked into over 160 online learning tools in various countries. The report found that nearly 90 percent had data practices that, quote, risked or infringed on children's rights. This includes everything from monitoring kids to collecting information on their identity, location, online activity and information about their family and friends. It's an issue the Federal Trade Commission has had its eyes on even prior to the report. It announced plans last week to crack down on companies illegally surveilling children during online learning. For the first time in a while, consumers in the U.S. will be catching a break. There could be some big-ticket bargains in the not-too-distant future. Major retailers, including Target, Walmart, and Best Buy, say they have high inventory on products like TV, furniture, and clothing, and they need to make space for new stuff. So that means they'll be marking down prices as a way to boost sales. This is a major change from last year, when discounts on big products were rare. 
that was due to low supply because of slowdowns at ports and production bottlenecks. Over in France, the Cannes Film Festival is underway as the war on Ukraine continues. For one refugee, the event is a completely different world from the one she escaped. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more. When Lesia Blitzerkovitz and her family set off to flee from Kyiv, she carried a small suitcase with winter clothes. Three months later, she finds herself in Cannes at the end of spring. For her, the glamour of the festival is a world apart from what she left. It's as if I'd been thrown in another world, a parallel universe, especially given what my compatriots are going through. It's really difficult. The Ukraine war has loomed large over the festival. Debates over cultural boycotts have been a running theme, with film directors and festival officials weighing in on the topic. Official Russian delegations were banned, while the opening ceremony featured a speech from Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. It's hard thinking about all those who stayed, all those who lost their jobs and their relatives. This is why you can't fully enjoy and relax here in Cannes. Khan faces shortages of workers in the hospitality sector, offering the possibility for some refugees to find work. City Hall estimates that France's hospitality industry has 150,000 jobs to fill. For hotel owner Naomi Duavrin, Blitzer Kovitz arrived just as she began recruiting for the upcoming season. Meeting Lesia, or just the fact of speaking about this war, makes you ask, where is Ukraine? What is it like? You start reading on the internet and you realize it seems like a beautiful country. And then when meeting Lesha, you realize that it also has beautiful people. They are incredible, with a philosophy of life that we have a lot to learn from. Blitzer Kovitz is one of some 800 refugees who have arrived in Cannes since the outset of the war. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. How do you feel about teeny tiny robots you can barely see? Well, engineers at Northwestern University have invented the smallest remote-controlled walking robots ever. Each one is roughly half a millimeter wide, not even as thick as a penny. A professor who helped lead the effort says it took a year and a half to create the minuscule metal creatures. The students involved with the effort designed robots that look like crabs and other animals. They used a malleable shape memory alloy. With the, pro- with the robots in standing position, the team used lasers to heat up certain joints, creating movement. They hope the invention can eventually be used in minimally invasive surgeries or to assemble and repair small-scale machines. Now to some real animals. A dog lover in Saudi Arabia has started a mobile pet grooming business. In the past, dogs were viewed as unclean there. But the business owner says people are becoming more open to canine companions. NTD's Andrew Thomas has a story. Nayef Al-Asaf used to spend long hours waiting at pet grooming clinics to pamper his pets. Now, his mobile pet grooming service tours the streets of Riyadh, offering a hassle-free experience to pet owners. I got the idea because I'm a pet owner. I have more than one pet, and it was hard for me to take them by car to a grooming shop. And when I arrived, I'd find three to four people ahead of me, so I had to wait with my three or four pets. It was not comfortable for me as a client, so my idea was to improve on this and serve people at their homes. Established in 2021, the business called PetX takes bookings through its website or WhatsApp. Raising a dog used to be difficult in the conservative kingdom, as the animal was largely viewed as unclean. But with a recent modernization drive in the country, Nayef says such views are changing. And Saudis are becoming more accepting of raising dogs as pets at home and seeing them in public. Our conservative society did not accept the idea of raising animals, especially the ones that live in houses or small apartments. They see that pets bring diseases or are unclean. But nowadays we can see them almost everywhere in public places, being walked by their owners. People started accepting those who raise a dog or a cat in their homes. The cost of the service provided ranges between $26 and $66, depending on the pet's size. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. That's the latest from the NTD business team and myself, Chenny Wu. You can follow me on Twitter. For NTD Business, that's all for today. Thanks for watching and have a nice, long weekend.